Welcome to the Protos Podcast. Today's date is Friday the 21st of January and you're listening to a weekly roundup of the most important stories from the past week as reported by us. This week, US officials are bracing themselves for a wave of tax evasion cases stemming from confused NFT collectors. A journalist manages to trick his way into a top role at Binance. And Chamath Palahapitiya is in hot water after seemingly dismissing the plight of China's Uyghur population. But first... To kick us off this week, tax officials in the US have warned of a tidal wave of tax evasion cases as many NFT collectors are still unsure about how to declare their crypto income. Experts have suggested that profits from sales on platforms like OpenSea or Rarible are taxed as ordinary income. They also agree that US residents buying NFTs with crypto typically owe capital gains taxes on both the purchase and future resales. However, as reported by Bloomberg, direct government guidance around the $44 billion NFT industry has been thin on the ground. Many NFT buyers are likely unaware that they need to pay taxes at all. On top of that, others may not even know that they're required to pay taxes quarterly if they owe more than $1,000. And while nobody knows exactly how much tax is owed, industry insiders reckon NFT investors could be owing billions of dollars this year. One reason for this could be that the US government chooses to categorise NFTs as collectibles. This carries with it a max capital gains rate of 28%, while stocks and most cryptocurrencies hold a rate of 20%. But there's no formal guidance specifically for NFTs, and the IRS doesn't accept ignorance as an excuse. In fact, some reckon that the IRS could start auditing before clarifying any rules around NFT trading as an investment. Tax attorney James Creech told Bloomberg that just because the IRS fails to provide guidance that meets certain expectations doesn't mean you get to not report any gains or losses. Creech warned, quote, the harder it is for people to get a reasonable or ideally a right conclusion, the easier it is to ignore it, end quote. So remember, if you're thinking of spending your life savings on a drawing of a chimp, check the IRS's FAQs to avoid any nasty surprises. Next up, Binance has been played by an undercover journalist who managed to bluff their way into a senior job at the crypto exchange. As detailed in the fintech blog Disruption Banking, reporter Henry Clinch responded to a Binance job advert for the senior regulatory advisory role last year. Through a fake resume and LinkedIn profile, Harry, under the guise of Daniel Somerset, claimed to be an anti-money laundering expert originally working for Binance's competitor Coinbase. Clinch wanted to investigate just how serious Binance is about cleaning up its act and how robust its regulatory recruitment process is. The high-ranking role and Binance's seemingly endless bad press had convinced Clinch that he would fail at the first hurdle. He wrote in his blog, quote, I envisaged crumbling when asked some complex questions about derivatives licensing regulation, end quote. But four miraculous interviews later, Binance actually offered him the job, a job with a salary of $218,000 and a promised sign-on bonus of close to $82,000 in Binance coin after six months. Now, considering the ease with which Clinch secured the role, it could be that Binance is struggling to put together a team of regulatory experts from scratch. Last year, the exchange pledged to hire a number of experts after a number of probes in the US and warnings from watchdogs worldwide. Many of these governmental agencies allege that Binance enables money laundering and tax evasion. They've hired former Russian and Ukrainian officials to fill senior regional posts while also pursuing meetings with US officials. Binance's chief exec, Champeng Zhao, expressed confidence that the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, will, quote, do the right thing towards crypto businesses. And yet, there appears to be a flaw in Binance's application forms. We got to speak to Clinch, who told us, quote, The fact that a journalist can successfully pass off as such an expert on four separate occasions and be offered a senior role in Binance's regulatory team suggests that their expertise in compliance might not be as strong as claimed. He added, tens of billions of dollars pass through Binance every day. For this reason, it's crucial that Binance demonstrates the utmost seriousness when it comes to regulatory affairs, end quote. 
Despite its difficulties, Binance claims its regulatory team is a top priority. Zhao claims he spent most of his recent time on compliance. Binance's headquarters left China for Tokyo back in 2017 after a crypto exchange crackdown in Beijing. Right now, it's registered in the Cayman Islands, but has shown possible interest in moving to Dubai or Bahrain. To this date, nobody is exactly sure where Binance's servers are located, which has regulators scratching their heads over which jurisdiction is responsible for keeping the exchange in check. The exchange's terms of service are bound by the laws of Hong Kong, but Binance executives are also incredibly difficult to locate, making it nearly impossible to serve them legal documents. For what it's worth, though, Binance did respond to unknowingly hiring an investigative journalist for the job. Quote, while he was offered the position, like any other company, after signing, he would have had to pass our background check, which is conducted by an independent third party. His fraudulent statements and falsified work history would have been easily flagged, they said. And for Binance's sake, let's hope that's true. And finally today, renowned venture capitalist and crypto investor Chamath Palahapithia has landed himself in hot water after dismissing the ongoing cultural genocide of China's Uyghur population. Palahapithia, who is known for his historic crypto investments, made the comments on the All In podcast he hosts with tech entrepreneur Jason Calacanis. Firstly, Calacanis brought up US President Joe Biden's policy on China and his statement regarding the treatment of Beijing's Uyghur population, specifically referring to the ongoing imprisonment and forced re-education of minorities in China's Xinjiang province. Palahapithia said... Quote, let's be honest, nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, end quote. While the remarks were instantly met with pushback from his co-host, the social capital billionaire actually doubled down. Palahapithia noted that he does care about climate change, America's, quote, crippling and decrepit healthcare infrastructure, and the US economy if China invades Taiwan. However, he went on to say, quote, if you're asking me, do I care about a segment of class of people in another country? Not until we can take care of ourselves will I prioritise them over us, end quote. Palahapitya just doesn't like pretending to care and said he'd rather be honest about the matter. But he faced more criticism online, particularly Twitter, where even the Golden State Warriors, Palahapitya's co-owned NBA team, attempted to distance itself from the Silicon Valley billionaire. They did it rather carefully, however, without touching on China or the Uyghurs directly. Back in 2019, the NBA was accused of, quote, bowing to China after Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey voiced support for a democratic Hong Kong. The statement from the Golden State Warriors said, As a limited investor who has no day-to-day operating functions within the Warriors, Palahapithia does not speak on behalf of our franchise, and his views certainly don't reflect those of our organisation. Since the unfolding public relations nightmare, Palahapithia has issued his own statement, emphasising, quote, Important issues deserved nuanced discussions, end quote. But just like the Warriors, he avoided explicitly naming the Uyghurs. He wrote, In re-listening to this week's podcast, I recognise that I come across as lacking empathy. I acknowledge that entirely. Adding, To be clear, my belief is that human rights matter, whether in China, the United States or elsewhere. Full stop. End quote. But human rights lawyer Rehan E. Asat levied sharp criticism at Palapahithia's statement. She tweeted, quote, I don't view this as an apology when he can't even acknowledge how his comment was hurtful to the Uyghur community. She finished by, China takes comfort knowing that corporate executives have their back and will continue this, end quote. This isn't the first time that Palapahithia has found himself embroiled in controversy over edgy comments. In November, Palahapitya and fellow venture capitalist David Sachs laughed about receiving large sums of Solana tokens at steep discounts and their subsequent attempts at offloading those holdings onto crypto markets. And that's your lot for today. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed this week's episode. But we understand that there's only so much we can squeeze into just one episode. So if you want more of the stories that matter, then check out protos.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Protos podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any other major podcast provider for more weekly roundups. We'll be back next week. See you then.